Johnny Craig, to say the very least, is a notoriously controversial figure. In my previous video, The Rise and Fall of Johnny Craig Part 1, I covered Johnny in his golden era as an artist. His rise to the top of clout and popularity in the late 2000s Warped Tour post-hardcore scene, becoming one of the scene's most popular figures, sending shockwaves throughout the alternative music world with his signature, powerful, soaring, angelic, soulful R&B-influenced vocals, with which he created a polarizing and revolutionary new style of post-hardcore as he laid down his unique vocals over the heavy, experimental post-hardcore core bands he was a part of, such as his first band, Dance Gavin Dance, as well as his second band, Amorosa. These bands became very big, very prominent acts, and very influential in the warp Tour scene at the time, and at this point, Johnny Craig's stints with these bands is looked back on and is regarded as somewhat legendary. He also released a very successful solo album on Rise Records in 2009 called A Dream is a Question You Don't Know How to Answer. <laughs> as well as being a part of the legendary one-off post-hardcore scene supergroup called Isles and Glaciers, alongside members of Pierce the Veil and Chiodos, releasing their one and only release, an EP called The Hearts of Lonely People back in 2010. A real rags to riches story. Johnny came from nothing, and with nothing but raw talent and an amazing singing voice to his name, he rose to the top of the scene, and by 2010, he was one of the biggest names in the scene, right up there with Craig Owens of Chiodos or Anthony Green of Circus Survive. Dude was killing it, releasing great records, and was on a seemingly non-stop upward trajectory to the top. The sky seemed to be the limit for the young Johnny Craig. However, behind the scenes, there was a lot of darkness, drama, and turmoil in Johnny Craig's life, which as time went on became harder and harder for him to keep behind closed doors and hide from the public eye. For example, in 2007, he joined his second band, Amorosa, after a very notorious and unceremonious split from his first band, Dance Gavin Dance. Johnny's bad attitude, crazy and erratic antics, and rampant drug and alcohol use caused the other members of DGD to want nothing to do with Johnny anymore. They spilled it all in a notorious public expose blog post about Johnny that they put on their MySpace. From then on, rumors of Johnny's hard drug use and crazy erratic behavior began to constantly run rampant throughout the scene. After a while, Johnny's tendency to be a lightning rod for drama and controversy began to take hold, and at a certain point, he became more known for his controversies than his music, for better or for worse. But much more on that later. My name is Julian, aka The Cozy Representative, and picking up right where we left off, welcome to the rise and fall of Johnny Craig, part two. Let's go. Content warning. This video contains frequent mentions and descriptions of sensitive subjects such as hard drug use. Viewer discretion is advised. So basically, in the latter half of 2010, as well as the beginning half of 2011, saw some really crazy times, as well as some really turbulent times for Johnny Craig, as well as Johnny Craig affiliated projects. The events that went down around this moment in time, around this era, are all very dramatic and like claustrophobic. They all happen really 
close together, and at times, the series of events that the timeline of all this stuff is a little confusing, so strap in tight, because it's a lot all at once, I'll say that. So, first things first, the craziness starts off on August 18th of 2010, and this was right at the end of that summer, so as Emma Rosa were wrapping up their stint on that summer's Warp Tour, when an article was posted to the Alternative Press website, which was titled, get a load of this, EXCLUSIVE! Dance Gavin Dance, part ways with vocalist, original vocalist Johnny Craig, back. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's see what the article had to say, shall we? Dance Gavin Dance have exclusively revealed to Alt Press that they have parted ways with vocalist Kurt Travis and that original vocalist Johnny Craig, now of Emma Rosa, and John Mess will be returning to the band to record a new album. The reunited lineup will also embark on a headlining run next spring. Craig will remain in Emma Rosa as well. DGD has released this statement to us. Dance Gavin Dance have officially parted ways with their vocalist Kurt Travis. The band and Kurt remain friends, and they wish Kurt all the best in all of his future endeavors. The band know they've been dealing with a lot of member changes, but they assure their fans that it's all for the best. They would also like to announce the return of original vocalist Johnny Craig. Johnny will join other returning vocalist John Mess in the studio this fall to record their forthcoming release on Rise Records due out next year. This will not affect Johnny Craig's work with Emma Rosa or his solo project. The band are excited to start the next chapter of Dance Gavin Dance and are excited to revisit the days of 2007's Downtown Battle Mountain. Holy shit. <laughs> this was fucking crazy. This was a big deal. This caused like so much hype in the scene at the time to happen. I don't know if you all remember, but it's interesting because the script has kind of flipped nowadays. Now, Everybody loves the Kurt Travis era of Dance Gavin Dance, or at least most people do. There's not really much hate for Kurt Travis's albums with Dance Gavin Dance. People love Death Star and Happiness, but at the time, that was not the case. It, like, <laughs> it was, even though those are great records, like, the cool thing to do on the internet during that time period was to be like, Fuck this new guy, I want Johnny back, man. Johnny was, Johnny and DGD was like the real shit, like, fuck this new guy. It didn't even matter, like, what the music with Kurt sounded like. They could have released, like, theoretically the greatest album of all time with Kurt Travis as their vocalist, but because people were so, like, everyone's underwear was in a bunch over Johnny Craig at the time, people, like, didn't give a fuck about it unless Johnny was in it. So this was a, this was a big deal. People were fucking excited to have Johnny back in DGD. Yo, if it sounds a little weird, I apologize. I might forget some shit. <laughs> but don't hate me! Because we're making a comeback. And so we're going to book shows here. And I promise you it's going to be the shit. I may or may not still be wearing the same outfit when we play. <laughs> this song's called I Have Been It Times You're Roaming Up In Your Face and Shit. Anyways, about a week or so after this news hit the internet, Kurt Travis, who had just been ousted from Dance Gavin Dance, people weren't really sure why, weren't really sure what happened, why he was out of the band, was he kicked out, did he leave, no one knew. He gave an interview with a publication called Dead Press, where he gave some insight into the band's decision at that time from his point of view, and it's, it's very interesting. Like I said, this is right after he departed from Dance Gavin Dance, so I'm gonna read some excerpts from this, it's pretty interesting, check it out. In some sort it said you left the band and in others it says you were asked to leave would you be able to clear that up a little bit I was definitely never going to quit so yeah I got kicked out the band told me that they were going to break up because they weren't happy with it, but before they did, they were going to do a tour with Johnny and just do Downtown Battle Mountain songs. Things didn't really happen the way they told me, it seems. Oh well. Due to the constant changes over the past few months, did you ever expect your leaving to happen, or was it a very sudden thing? Uh, in an interview with Alt Press, Johnny Craig said he'd been invited in on a few sessions you were having for him to sing along with you on some tracks. 
Like I said, I wasn't too shocked when it happened. I was just trying to stay in DGD as long as I could, knowing one day it would come to an end. Tim, who was their bassist at the time, and he's actually, he returned to the band, and he's their bassist now again, Tim Fierick. Uh Tim had always hinted that I was next, getting kicked out, and that I should go with him, but I felt that it was beneficial for me to ride it out. I'm not a quitter, especially when it comes to music. As far as Johnny and I collaborating, it was in the works with a side project that members of DGD were working on, not the actual band. Now, I'm not sure what they have planned for the material that we were both going to sing on. Now, this this one is interesting. Have you spoken to any members of DGD or Johnny Craig since it was announced that you were no longer in the band? Is there any bad water between any of you? I've always kept in touch with Johnny. He's one of my longest friendships before, during, and even after me being a part of DGD. Even now, we laugh about what has happened. I'm actually helping Johnny out right now on his upcoming solo tour playing guitar, piano, maybe some backup vocals if we figure it out in time. We hit the road on September 8th and it's going to be some much needed distraction from my current goals at hand. Johnny told me that he knows how I feel. When he got kicked out of DGD, it was depressing for him because all he wanted to do was get away from bullshit and go back on tour. He's really helping me out mentally, getting my mind off the concept of rejection that I'm feeling right now from working so hard for almost three years in DGD and having it stripped away from me. As far as the members of DGD, there's no bad water between us, although I do realize now that me being a part of the band was completely business, not long-lasting friendships. None None of them have contacted me since I stepped out of the van when we got home after the Scream It Like You Mean It tour. When you spend so much time with certain people, you'd think that there was at least some friendship, but I've realized that it was only on the surface. It's very sad because I love them all and wish the best for them, but I don't think it's mutual. I may be wrong. I hope I am. Now that's pretty interesting stuff, pretty raw and, and you know, hardcore after him being kicked out of Dance Gavin Dance had just happened, so all that stuff was still fresh. Obviously, you know, they did turn out to become friends again. This one goes down to my boy, Johnny Craig! Which we've seen them do many tours together with Kurt Travis's, you know, bands after Dance Gavin Dance, a lot like Birds and DGD, and they've even done some collaborations with each other since then. So it's very nice that they have, like, mended the relationship and they're boys again. It's always very heartwarming to see Kurt with members of DGD hanging out and doing stuff, but it sounds like in typical like DGD fashion around this time, some drama related to him getting ousted from DGD. But anyway, back to the, <laughs> back to the, back to the main story. So following the craziness of this announcement of Johnny being back in DGD, Johnny then headed back out with Emma Rosa on a pretty big, pretty high profile hype tour in the fall of 2010, uh, October and November to be exact opening up for August Burns Red and Bring Me the Horizon on that fall's AP tour. This was definitely one of the biggest tours that Emerosa had been a part of, you know, considering Bring Me the Horizon were basically one of the biggest bands in the whole scene at that point, so that was pretty, pretty good on them. So, following this fall tour uh, with Emma Rosa, Johnny met up with the Dance Gavin Dance Boys in the studio in December of 2010 to lay down vocal parts for the next DGD album, which was appropriately going to be titled Downtown Battle Mountain 2. <sighs> so, okay. <laughs> This is where shit gets crazy. Uh, the next part goes like this. So, to set the scene, we find ourselves in February of 2011. Do you remember it? That was a nice time. I was having a good time in February of 2011. I was like 14. It was fun. Anyway, not for Johnny Craig. <laughs> Johnny, at this point in time, was the singer of both Dance Gavin Dance and Emma Rosa at the same time, somehow. Both of these bands had been off of the road for the past few months, spending time at home for the holidays, no touring. As I stated, Dance Gavin Dance were in the studio, busy writing and recording their next record, which had been slated to release on March 8th of 2011. On February 20th, however, of 2011, an editorial was posted onto a website called mindequalsblown.net. What was this editorial called, you ask? <laughs> well, it was titled Johnny Craig's Great 
$8,000 to $12,800 swindle. The story. Huh. That doesn't sound like it has anything to do with recording the next Dance Gavin Dance record. Swindle? $8,000 to $12,000? What could that mean? Well, let's open the article and find out. Oh, also, okay, before I jump into this thing, so the way that this article is set up, I I'm gonna read the whole thing and, g and get into it, but basically there was, like, an original article posted, and then in the following days, the subsequent days, there were updates to the story. So the article was edited, and they, th they threw in updates after the fact. So basically, I'm just gonna read it. Like, in, in chronological order, I'm gonna do the original article and then read every update that followed. Sound good? Let's go. Alright, so, original article. The internet has come alive with the news that the disgraced Johnny Craig, lead singer of Emma Rosa and Dance Gavin Dance, has been scamming his own fans out of an alleged, and somewhat confirmed by our own investigating, eight thousand to twelve thousand eight hundred dollars under the guise of selling black macbooks on his personal twitter account due to the sheer amount of rumors being spread about the situation we at mind equals blown decided to do some digging uh, and bring you what we believe to be the real truth on the story prepare for what we are calling the great eight thousand to twelve thousand eight hundred dollar swindle that's a mouthful say that three times fast <laughs> uh and then they have a um screenshot of a tweet that Johnny Craig <laughs> posted on January 19th, 2011. Last chance, brand new black MacBook. $800 will go lower. Just talk me into it. That's what she said. For real, let's bargain. Johnny has of course denied any allegations that he has done anything wrong and believes that somewhere over the two months of Twitter messages he sent advertising the black MacBook for sale, his account had been hacked. The story begins slightly before this though, with a person who was scammed before he started to advertise the sale of the black MacBook in question. Since she intends to press charges against Johnny, we can only identify her as Stacy. On September 2nd of 2010, Johnny posted on his Twitter account that he was selling an autographed microphone that he had used at a show. As something of a romantic gesture, Stacy made a deal with Johnny to buy it for $300 as an anniversary present for her boyfriend. Johnny agreed on the price, but only on the condition that he received the money the next day before noon. <laughs> not sketchy at all. Stacy then transferred the money via Western Union and did not, and still has not, received the microphone. Johnny kept in touch with Stacy and even met her and her boyfriend after a show on October 31st in their hometown, with promises that he would pay her back after signing her boyfriend's magazine. Stacy didn't hear from Johnny again until January 9th of 2011 when she began to fill out court papers to take legal action against him. He told her that he was selling his laptop that he had tweeted about buying on January 6th in order to pay her back. He insisted he wasn't trying to scam her and that, quote, he was selling everything he owns to pay her back. And then a screenshot of a tweet from January 6th, Johnny saying 500 bucks in reference to him selling this laptop to pay her back. The number that she used to contact Johnny matches up to all of the other personal accounts from the people scammed that we have received, and it matches a tweet made by Johnny himself in 2010 that he posted in an attempt to buy drugs. His addiction to heroin was covered in an email I received from a former fan called Brittany, who confirms that he also uses Oxycontin and cocaine, and that he has previously texted her from said phone number asking for the aforementioned drugs whenever he happens to be in town. Brittany had previously met Johnny and said of him that, quote, he really is crazy. He has something messed up in his head and that he needs help. The business on Twitter surrounding his alleged 859 phone number has turned out to be untrue and the number he used to both score drugs and to contact the buyers of MacBooks has since been disconnected. His close friend Mod Son confirmed this on Twitter. <laughs> and you should be happy as fuck. That's pretty good. You Going back to Stacy's story, Johnny called her on said number around the time of her beginning to file court papers to confirm that he was about to receive a check for $5,000. Rather conveniently, this is pretty much the same amount of money, $4,950, that the Facebook group called Johnny Craig Twitter Scam is claiming has been scammed out of his loving gullible fans. 
The story I've now heard from multiple people is that Johnny would post an ad on his Twitter account claiming to be selling a black MacBook for a figure of around $600 to $800. On agreeing uh, the sum of money with the fan, eager to receive a bargain and a rare opportunity to deal with the singer of one of their favorite bands, Johnny would request that the person use a wire transfer, typically Western Union, because he claimed that he had been, quote, fucked using PayPal in the past, and this way both of them would receive paperwork detailing the transfer. With Western Union, you need identification to both send and receive money, so the claims from Johnny that someone else was scamming these people through his account rings slightly hollow unless someone has the ID to collect money sent to Jonathan Monroe Craig in his hometown and state. So far, of the people we have spoken to directly, the amount accounted for is somewhere in the region of $4,000, but of the currently 24 members of that Facebook group and the many people on Twitter who claim to have been uh, subject to the same scam, we have only received contact from a handful of those people. Johnny's close friend Mod Sun has felt that it was necessary to say his thoughts on the matter in a series of tweets regarding his perceived involvement in the controversy. He said, Dear friends, so one of my very close friends, Johnny Craig, has recently made some very bad decisions. His actions are now being directed at me by certain people that he hurt or er, ripped off. I am now forced to address this issue. I truly apologize if you have been taken advantage of by him. It's very sad. I need you to understand that I have nothing to do with any of this. I mean absolutely nothing. He had someone PayPal me money one time for his old laptop he was selling. It was transferred to me and I immediately gave him cash. This was 35 days ago. Any point after that, my account was not used. He continued trying to sell a MacBook for a month after that. I truly apologize for his actions because I feel bad for the people who try to support him and get hurt. I'm one of those people as well. I would never treat my friends like that. So there it is. I have called him and let him know the severity of the situation and am trying to help y'all. So it seems that even those who consider Johnny to be a close friend are at this point feeling like they have to step up and almost speak for him. And in this case, apologize on his behalf in the face of his continued denial that he has done anything wrong. As of right now, not a single person who has transferred money to Jonathan Mon Monroe Craig has received anything in return. If you have been scammed or have any information, please email us. Pretty fucking wild. So that's the original article that was posted. Now here's the updates to the article that were then posted in subsequent days following the original breaking of this. Because this also, you know, <laughs> sent shockwaves of drama and craziness throughout the scene at the time, as you could imagine. Update number one. I have so far received 16 reports from fans scammed by Johnny Craig, putting the total somewhere between a minimum of $8,000 and a maximum of $12,800 based on the prices quoted in his tweets. We have been sent a range of pictures of Western Union email confirmations, moneygram transfer receipts, text message conversations about transactions with his confirmed 504 phone number, and email exchanges about transactions with his confirmed I still feel her email address. Update number two. More of Johnny's friends have begun weighing in on the situation via Twitter. Craig Owens and Nick Martin of Drugs and Isles and Glaciers both have tweeted recently. Craig Owens at 1.20 p.m. And people wonder why we won't do another Isles and Glaciers record. And then Nick Martin said, quote of the day right there. Dude, no tolerance for that junk. Update number three, Dance Gavin Dance bassist Eric Lodge releases a statement to urge fans to direct their emotions towards Johnny and not the bands he is a member of, to which he says, quote, I'm writing this as a reaction slash personal outlet to Johnny's most recent actions. They strike me as disappointing, but in no way surprising. Selfish individuals often do ego maniacal things. In my opinion, this is consistent with his repertoire. However, in previous instances, such selfishness didn't come at the expense of his faithful fans. I plainly wanted everyone reading this to know that he acted as an individual, and this has nothing to do with any other members of DGD or even Amorosa. Many of you have every right to be angry. I wrote this with no intentions of defending Johnny. Instead, I would simply like those who are angry to understand the rightful direction of their emotion. As for any advice for Johnny, in the words of Elton John, the bulldog is barking in the backyard. 
Update number four, we have an exclusive mindequalsblown.net interview with bandmate John Mess of Dance Gavin Dance on the Johnny Craig situation. Click here for the interview. Let's go. Let's click it. Let's find out. Let's check this out. Interview, John Mess of Dance Gavin Dance. A month ago, you interviewed with Alt Press and said, so we're at the point where we'll see how long we can do this without Johnny dying or whatever. Is this the whatever point or will the show go on? The show will go on. As things pan out, we can make a more accurate assessment of how we as individuals and as a band feel, as well as the additional vague assertion that the future is indeed unforeseen seeable at this point. In the same interview, you essentially said that despite Johnny's antics, it's part of his entertainment factor. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, I would much rather align myself with a more do champion de diest philosophy revival. I don't know like what he's talking about, so sorry if I'm mispronouncing any of this. Um, <laughs> mixed with a postmodern anti meta narrative school of thought and put a wet blanket on all these idealistic humanist fucks that are essentially just grasping for identity. Some people lack the capacity to ingest even a smudge of Eastern thought while modernists, indulgent and romanticizing, continue to get off on existence. <laughs> John Mess, man, that's fucking, that's John Mess for you. All right. When did you first become aware of the alleged scamming? Has anything like this happened in the past to your knowledge? The only thing I have really reflected on is how exciting it is to know someone who now has 20 plus memes. I've always loved a well done meme and the combination of actually knowing the person is just satirical gold. Honestly, a comedic gem I will forever cherish. Have you spoken to Johnny since the accusations. If so, did he speak of them? Johnny and I talk through Skype with the sound turned off. We have both been learning sign language recently and MacBook is a sign neither of us know. <laughs> Bruh. Do you think the events that are unfolding are an accurate depiction of Johnny Craig as a human being? There is no accurate depiction of Johnny Craig that could ever be conceived. <laughs> Bruh. How does this affect the band? Have you discussed the situation with the other members yet? Some kids told me they won't buy the record. This is unfortunate for everyone involved with the band besides the band. Based on some of the article comments that we have received, are you worried about the potential negative backlash it shows? If you attempt to beat up Johnny Craig at a show on our tour, I will be in a secure and hidden location filming with an eight HD camcorder and a boom mic. I have always dreamed of having a highly successful YouTube video. <laughs> Bruh. We have received several personal accounts detailing Johnny's drug use. Stories of him bringing people into the studio to score pills and other such things. Has this always been going on? How ridiculous has it gotten? I'm not going to start telling tales because I think the real question people need to be asking is, does Johnny Craig have enough ridiculous stories that can be compiled to fill an entire movie or documentary and would I watch it? The answer is yes, and it will cost $19.95. Bruh. You, as well as most of the rest of the band, have clearly had a rough past with him. Why bring him back for another album? Did anyone expect it to be any different? I like everything he did on the album, so mission successful. Alright, well, we got the word from John Mess, I guess. Thanks, bro, you really filled us in with that one. <laughs> it is funny and interesting, though, how other members of DGD seem to view Johnny as a person around this time. They're just like, yep, that's just... He's... That's him! We know just as much as you. We're in the same boat as all of you. Like, this is just this guy. He's crazy. Strange and interesting band dynamic, I will say, and, and band situation as well. So, you want to know my thoughts on the situation? Johnny was taking advantage of his fans. In my eyes, an incredibly cold and heartless thing to do. I mean, it's evil to scam anybody in, in, in any situation. Scamming is a horrible, fucking despicable thing to do. It's manipulative thievery, and it's really gross, but what Johnny was doing was extra deplorable if you ask me considering he was heartlessly scamming money out of his fans the people who support him and make it possible for him to live the dream aka make a living for himself by making music and going out on tour the audience and the fans he had are the number one 
only reason he's able to live this great life having an audience and having a platform and making a living off of your art that's a very precious thing it doesn't happen to everybody it's it's an incredibly special life to lead you're incredibly lucky if you get to be able to do that most people go to their grave wishing the whole time that they could live the kind of life that Johnny was living and be in his position the fact that he seemed to be cold-hearted enough to completely take advantage of this and manipulate and scam his fans out of money shows that he absolutely had zero respect for his loving supporters and that he obviously did not take his position of power all that seriously which shows that he really just wasn't grateful he was selfish he was being cold-hearted like i said he was being completely disrespectful to the fans who made him who he was and gave him his platform which is the most ungrateful you could possibly be now it is obvious that Johnny was doing a lot of heroin. That was what fueled him scamming people. That was what fueled this. And it's obvious that Johnny is a very troubled man who has been dealing with the burden of living with a hard drug addiction for a long time. And I get that. As a person who has dealt with addiction issues in the past myself, I do have a certain level of empathy for Johnny. I do understand that when you are addicted to a substance and you're fucked up all the time and you're out of your mind, you're not thinking in your right mind and you will often do things completely out of character. Oftentimes, Johnny, or supporters of his, have throughout the years kind of brushed off the severity of the MacBook scandal by saying, oh, he was on a lot of heroin, he was fucked up, he wasn't thinking clearly, it wasn't really him. People do things when they're fucked up that they would never do when they were sober, anything to get that next high. And to a certain extent, sure, there's truth and validity to that, but the way I look at it, Johnny scammed how many people? 16? Yeah, 16 people over the course of like several months. Strategically, <laughs> he had to be in contact with 16 different parties. He had to be sober enough to at least give them clear instructions on how to wire transfer him money. You see what I'm saying? It's not like he just got really fucked up once and did like one really fucked up thing randomly regardless of how much heroin he was doing at the time or how much he was drinking or whatever the fact that he scammed like thousands of dollars out of 16 different people shows that he was obviously thinking about this enough to be okay with doing it over and over and over and over again to a bunch of different people systematically over the course of several months. You see what I'm saying? That's not getting high and losing control and doing something fucked up once. Johnny was heartlessly systematically scamming a bunch of fans. He knew what he was doing. And if he wasn't caught, which obviously he was going to get caught how could you steal that much money from that many people and not think someone was gonna speak up about it when they weren't getting their fucking 700 dollars macbook but if he wasn't caught who's to say he wouldn't have kept going and scamming more people to this day i do think that a lot of people really downplay the severity of how shitty and deplorable the macbook situation really was. Also, another thing, I think that the fans' reaction to the MacBook scandal was really a sign of the times. You see, nowadays, if an up-and-coming singer did a MacBook scam now, they would be cancelled. <laughs> like, right? Career over, disgraced, no more bands, no more touring, right? No more, a label wouldn't want to sign them after that. People wouldn't want to work with them. It'd be a bad look. Things have evolved since 10 years ago, and thankfully, nowadays, people are a lot more serious about keeping this kind of behavior uh, and the people who exhibit this kind of behavior out of music and art scenes, which is a very good thing. Say what you want about cancel culture, but it's definitely doing a good job keeping scumbags and predators from being able to manipulate their fan bases and harming people and being in a position of power and influence, which they really shouldn't be at all. I don't think Johnny should have been in a position of power after he got exposed for the MacBook scandal. But he was, that wasn't the case. At the time, I don't know what it was about people back then, uh, but Johnny just 
kind of got away with it in a lot of ways. Sure, his name and reputation were definitely tainted from that moment forward. You know, you couldn't think about Johnny without thinking about MacBooks or making some kind of MacBook joke or some kind of meme or whatever, but he was still able to tour, he was still signed to his label, he was still in bands and playing for large crowds and having a career touring and playing music. That was not stripped away from him in any way. And although there were a lot of people who did disgrace Johnny and his actions and stopped supporting him after the MacBook scandal, I feel like the majority of people actually thought the MacBook scandal was just kind of funny. And it did turn into this huge meme for years. <laughs> but anyway, that's those are my thoughts on it. It was fucked up. It was... It's deplorable, really, and it's fucked up that he kind of got away with it. I don't know. I think the label ended up uh, paying those people back, and I think Johnny put out a statement. Let's find the statement that he put out. <laughs> okay, so March 9th, 2011. Here's his statement. Are you ready? I want to apologize for my recent behavior. My actions regarding taking advantage of fans was inexcusable. I'm in the process of paying everyone back, so please forgive me. My state of mind was completely shot, and obviously my decision-making skills were heavily impaired due to my drug use. I've since been in detox and successfully completed the treatment. I've learned a lot from this ordeal, and I realized I've redeemed my second chance. Okay, I want to personally thank Eric at Artery and Craig at Rise for helping me through this emotionally and financially. I'm embarrassed with my past actions. I want to make amends to everyone I hurt. Again, sorry to all my fans, family, bandmates, and colleagues. I'm truly sorry. Now back to work. I'm looking forward to seeing all the DGD fans and their positive energy that they always bring to the shows. With that being said, the past will stay dead and let's toast to the future kids. All right, that's it. It sounds a little bit like he was sitting with his uh, <laughs> his management team and they were, you know what I mean? Like, all right, next you should say, you know, you should throw this in there. I don't know. I don't know. It is what it is. There's his statement. Dance Gavin Dance were still on the road, still releasing the next album. Th there you have it. That, that, the MacBook scandal, that was it. Let's get back to the story, shall we? What happens next? Following all of this madness, Dance Gavin Dance continued on as normal with their already scheduled plans and released their fourth studio album, Downtown Battle Mountain 2, on March 8th of 2011 through Rise Records. <laughs> as a return to form album for the band so to speak this album obviously marked the return of Johnny Craig as well as the return of their screamer John Mess as I've already stated the hype from the fans was off the chain for this new Dance Gavin Dance record and the return of the original DGD lineup considering for the last few years prior to 2011 the Dance Gavin Dance lineup had changed so much in just a short amount of time by the time they put out their 2009 record Happiness the only two original members left in the band were drummer Matt Mingus and guitarist Will Swan, leaving many fans to be kind of disillusioned and annoyed with Dance Gavin Dance, because at that point, with such a revolving cast of bassists, guitarists, and vocalists, you didn't really know who was going to be in or out of Dance Gavin Dance every few months. Not a very good business model, considering it's important for fans to identify with familiar faces in a band's lineup, you know what I mean? Anyway, <laughs> John and Johnny are back. Downtown Battle Mountain 2. Here we go. At the end of the day, I think that Downtown Battle Mountain 2 is an incredibly amazing album. It's one of my favorite Dance Gavin Dance albums for a variety of reasons. I definitely also recognize, though, that it might be one of the more polarizing Dance Gavin Dance albums. And before I go any further, I want to go a little bit into my own personal backstory and personal relationship with this album and what it means to me, because I do have a very strong personal connection to Downtown
Motown Battle Mountain 2, which might cloud my judgment of this album as a whole just a little bit. And also, I know how YouTube comment sections work. I know how people are. Um, if you're going to be one of those people who's like, Dude, you went on way too long about how you got into Downtown Battle Mountain 2. Like, you went on way too long, bro. Then just, uh, before you even leave a comment like that, just right now, skip ahead like two or three minutes, because I'm going to be talking about me in high school for a little bit. If you're not interested in that, just skip ahead. But to me, this is important. I wanted to include this. So, Downtown Battle Mountain 2 was the first album that I ever listened to, the first album that I ever got into by Dance Gavin Dance. Uh, it was my introduction to the band, and I got into it right after it came out back in 2011. I was a freshman in high school, and to put it bluntly, this album literally completely blew apart <laughs> my tiny 14 year old mind. <laughs> I, like, wasn't the same after I had gotten into this album. I had never heard anything like it. And in a lot of ways, it kind of completely changed the way that I perceived music in general after that. I'm not even kidding. Before I had listened to Downtown Battle Mountain 2, I pretty much exclusively listened to, like, neon pop punk bands, like Fall Out Boy, <laughs> Taking Back Sunday, All Time Low, The Main, etc. That was my shit. For me, music as a whole kind of started and stopped with the bands like those. I had a very rigid view and understanding of what could and couldn't be done by a band musically. To me at the time, a song had to have a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, and a bridge, and a chorus in that order. That was, that was a song. There was no other way to make a song, and a song had to follow specific basic chord progressions and very basic typical keys, paint by numbers, if you will. It had to have catchy melodies and a chorus. Basically what I'm saying is, you know, I had a very basic, narrow, rigid view of what music in general was. Music had a lot of confines and limitations in my mind due to growing up listening to primarily basic pop punk bands up until that point. Until I was 14 in my freshman year of high school <laughs> and some older kind of stoner scene kids that I was friends with told me to listen to the recently released Downtown Battle Mountain 2, and this rigid understanding of music that I had built up got completely shattered by literally this one album. <laughs> All of a sudden, all of these things that I didn't think were possible became possible. Songs didn't have to follow a predictable, easy to follow song structure. Songs didn't have to follow any sort of format whatsoever. Dance Gavin Dance's erratic and confusing blend of jazzy, noodly, heavy screamo with soul vocals over it shattered everything I thought I knew about music and opened up all sorts of doors of possibility when it came to how music can be arranged and written and presented. It also made me realize that there's a beauty in this kind of chaos. Although this album was challenging and difficult for me to get into and wrap my head around at first, once I listened to it enough, it stopped sounding like unintelligible random noise and at a certain point, it just kind of clicked and I realized how incredible this album is, and I quickly became obsessed. I listened to this album non-stop, and from there I worked my way backwards and became obsessed with all of DGD's previous albums prior to this one, and I listened to those non-stop as well. There was about a year or two in high school where all I listened to was Dance Gavin Dance, as well as music related to Dance Gavin Dance, like Emma Rosa or A Lot Like Birds, or similar to Dance Gavin Dance, like Chiodos or The Fall of Troy. <laughs> I had a full-on obsession with post-hardcore, and my favorite of all of those bands was Dance Gavin Dance. Still to this day, DGD are one of my favorite bands of all time, and they are also uh, one of my most listened to bands ever. Apparently, according to Spotify, Dance Gavin Dance was my number one most listened to artist of the decade for the 2010s, which I was not surprised to find out. <laughs> and all of this started with Downtown Battle Mountain 2, with me listening to that album when I was 14. So you can see what this album means to me. <laughs> also, I should mention as well that right around the time when I started listening to Downtown Battle Mountain 2 and getting my mind blown by this album was also the exact same time when I started smoking tons and tons of weed and getting my mind blown in plenty of other ways by my new best friend, Marijuana, <laughs> which may in some ways have helped me understand uh, Dance Gavin Dance and their wacky, erratic music in ways 
activities I wouldn't have without the aid of marijuana, but that's a whole other can of beans. Anyways, aside from my own personal experiences with Downtown Battle Mountain 2, like I said earlier, I can see how this album might be one of Dance Gavin Dance's more polarizing albums. It's definitely a very experimental album, it's very dense, it's probably the least poppy or catchy thing they've like ever done, you know what I mean? Unlike the first Downtown Battle Mountain, which right off the bat just feels like a classic record and is a lot more digestible than Downtown Battle Mountain 2, and it also has like hit single type songs such as Times New Roman or Lemon Meringue Tie. Downtown Battle Mountain 2 doesn't really have any songs that really work as singles besides maybe Heat Seeking Ghost of Sex or maybe Blue Dream, maybe even Elder Goose, but like <laughs> but, you know, even those songs are, like, far too experimental and out there to be in any way easily digestible by any, like, mass audience of people, you know? So in some ways, Downtown Battle Mountain 2 was kind of a strange album for Dance Gavin Dance to release at this time. It felt a lot less like a sequel to the first Downtown Battle Mountain and more like a step into a completely new strange direction that Johnny Craig just happened to be a part of. Despite its polarizing, dense, and experimental nature, like I said, I really do think that Downtown Battle Mountain 2 is an amazing album. Uh, the guitar work is absolutely insane. Up until that point, you know, the guitars on a, on a Dance Gavin Dance record had never been that intricate and complicated and crazy, in my opinion. The song structures and the way the songs are set up are really mind-blowing in certain places, like, for example, Example, the last minute or two of the song Spooks, it just goes absolutely insane, or the last minute or two of the song Need Money are insanely epic and still to this day give me chills when I hear them and make me go, God damn, how did they come up with that? John Mess's lyrics are more ridiculous than ever and are an absolute blast to listen to and pick apart, not to mention he's way better and more skilled at screaming than on any Dance Gavin Dance album prior to this, and it's great to hear him sound great and absolutely kill it. Johnny, as usual, sounds fucking great on this album. He's killing it. But I do have to say, I've hinted at this already, I'm gonna say it again. If you ask me, this album specifically is the very last album released during Johnny Craig's classic period, or Johnny Craig's prime, if you will. Now, all artists have a prime, an era in which they made arguably their best music, and they were particularly fresh and the most exciting, you know? For Taking Back Sunday, you could say that Tell All Your Friends, Where You Wanna Be, and Louder Now was their prime. For Fall Out Boy, everything in their pre-hiatus run was their prime. For Say Anything, Is A Real Boy, In Defense Of The Genre, and Self-Titled was his prime. For Johnny, if you ask me, it was everything he did starting with the Whatever I Say is Royal Ocean EP up until Downtown Battle Mountain 2. That was his prime, if you ask me. Whatever I Say is Royal Ocean, Downtown Battle Mountain, Relativity, his solo record, Isles and Glaciers, Emerosa Self-Titled, and Downtown Battle Mountain 2. That was like it. That was Johnny Craig. <laughs> After Downtown Battle Mountain 2, while there has been some good stuff coming out from him here and there, uh, nothing has really come close to how special and authentic and genuinely great the music he was a part of was in this era, if you ask me. Somehow, through a drugged out haze, <laughs> he somehow effortlessly sang his soaring, angelic vocals through five great classic records in just a few short years. Johnny was really on fire during this time and, like I said earlier, was on a consistent upward trajectory. Until after Downtown Battle Mountain 2 came out. This is where the water in the Johnny Craig story gets very, very murky. Uh, the MacBook scandal had happened, and although he's had his ups and downs, he's never truly recovered or redeemed himself since then. And the music has suffered too. Like, since then, it goes like this. He'll have a couple seemingly good years, but every two or three years or so, like clockwork, you can count on it. There's another big Johnny Craig scandal, followed by another big purge in his fan base, followed by yet another Johnny Craig comeback where he tries to convince you that he's clean and sober now, and that he's learned from his mistakes, and that he's turned over a new leaf, and that he's changed. Uh, and then he'll put out a few decent records, build up some new hype, you know, kind of build up a new fan base a little bit, try to see if everybody can forget about 
about the old shit, and then coast for about two years until the next Johnny Craig scandal happens, and then you learn that he was, oh, never actually sober, never actually clean at all during that whole time, and he's still been up to the same old scummy shit. <laughs> Repeat cycle over and over again. That's basically been the last, like, ten years of Johnny Craig's career, from all the way back in 2011 with the MacBook scandal, up until his last big scandal, which I've, if I remember correctly, uh, was right around the beginning of this year, 2020. So that being said, let's take it from right where we were in the story chronologically, which was 2011. So, Downtown Battle Mountain 2 came out in March of 2011, and following this, Dance Gavin Dance spent March and April of that year headlining their Downtown Battle Mountain tour, uh, with openers I Wrestled a Bear Once, In Fear and Faith, Close to Home, and Just Like Vinyl, a big tour which had, you know, just as much hype and excitement from fans surrounding it as their new record did. A couple days after this tour had wrapped up, however, on April 11th of 2011, it had been reported on Alternative Press that Johnny Craig was no longer a member of Emma Rosa. Holy shit. Alt Press has exclusively learned that embattled vocalist Johnny Craig is no longer a member of Emma Rosa. The band are not breaking up and they will still be playing their scheduled set at Bamboozle. A statement released by the band reads, quote, as of today, Johnny Craig is no longer a member of Emma Rosa. This decision has been a hard one to make, but we feel it is in the best interest for the band going forward. The vocalist, who recently rejoined Dance Gavin Dance, has endured a term turbulent few months. In February, in the midst of a public struggle with substance abuse, fans began accusing Craig of orchestrating an elaborate internet scam in which he accepted thousands of dollars for laptops he never sent. Later that month, Craig entered a North Hollywood detox facility and has since been released. Rise Records and the Artery Foundation Artist Management promised they would repay the fans Craig swindled. Amorosa haven't said what they plan to do about filling Craig's spot, but we'll keep you posted as more details emerge. Former Tides of man vocalist Tillian Pearson filled in for Craig on tour when he was in detox. Craig tweeted, quote, I got no hard feelings for any of the dudes in Emma Rosa. I am more than happy to be with DGD and working on my solo shit. Hope they can keep up. <laughs> he also said that he's recording vocals for two new Dance Gavin Dance songs this week, so pretty, pretty fucking crazy. I mean, I, I get this decision on multiple levels. I mean, first thing, I don't really understand how Johnny thought that he was gonna, you know, be the singer of both Emma Rosa and Dance Gavin Dance at the same time. Did he talk that over with anybody? I mean, Emma Rosa was like, they were a full-time touring band. They weren't like a side project, and neither was Dance Gavin Dance at that point either. One of the bands was gonna have to slow down, or both of them were gonna have to split their time evenly in order for Johnny to, you know, devote enough time to make albums and tour with both bands. It doesn't sound like he really planned that out in his head, and if I was in Amorosa, I'd be like, what the fuck, bro? You just joined Dance Gavin Dance out of nowhere, and you're, like, <laughs> on tour with them now again? Mm. Also, that's on top of the fact that he's, like, battling a very public heroin addiction and scamming fans for, m for money for selling fake MacBooks on Twitter at the same time. Not a very good look. I think if I was in Amorosa, I would have been like, peace out, bro. I totally understand their decision on that one. But yeah, anyways... Johnny Craig, no longer an Amorosa. What happens next? Well, let me tell you, following this, Dance Gavin Dance spent that summer of 2011 on that year's Vans Warp Tour. <laughs> Now, after the Warp Tour, Dance Gavin Dance were 
supposed to embark on a fall headlining tour, which was called the Go Big or Go Home Tour with opening acts I Set My Friends on Fire, A Lost for Words, and Our Last Night opening. A pretty, pretty stacked bill, if I do say so myself. Now, the tour had been fully booked. There were tour dates, venues lined up. There was a tour flyer made. There was a bunch of hype building for the tour amidst the fan base and the scene until randomly and completely abruptly on October 19th, 2011, it had been reported that Dance Gavin Dance had canceled the whole tour, seemingly out of nowhere. Here's their statement. We regret to inform everyone that due to circumstances beyond our control, we have been forced to cancel our upcoming tour. We apologize to everyone that bought tickets and was looking forward to coming out and seeing us and the rest of the bands. Now at first, obviously they gave no real reasoning behind the cancellation and it was all pretty mysterious and vague until it was soon revealed a couple days later that the reason for the cancellation of this tour was because Johnny Craig had gotten arrested on drug-related charges. On October 21st of 2011, Alternative Press published an exclusive interview uh, with Dance Gavin Dance's guitarist Will Swan on Johnny Craig's arrest as well as the band's future. Check it out. On Wednesday, Dance Gavin Dance canceled their upcoming tour for then unknown reasons. Soon, however, it was revealed that the reason for the cancellation was frontman Johnny Craig's latest drug-related arrest. Craig was held on two counts of narcotics possession, two counts of illegal drug use, and one count of failure to appear, stemming from a September 21st arrest. Craig appeared in Solano County, California court this afternoon. A further arraignment is scheduled for Monday at 1.30 Pacific Time. All Press obtained an exclusive interview with DGD guitarist Will Swan, in which he addressed Johnny's problems and the future of the band. Check it out below. When and how did you find out that Johnny had been arrested? I found out from a friend who saw it online. We really had no idea he was in trouble with the law. Have you talked to Johnny since his arrest? What's his mindset like? No, he hasn't had a phone for a few months, and he hasn't made any attempt to contact us. What are your feelings toward Johnny at the moment? Are you angry? Disappointed? I am disappointed that he kept his charges from us so we had no opportunity to help him seek help, but he hardly ever listens to our advice. How had Johnny been doing prior to the setback? We tried multiple times to get him to agree to rehab. After Warp Tour, we gave him the option of going to a rehab facility for at least a month at no cost to him. He wouldn't go. We didn't see much of him for a few weeks, and when we did, he seemed to be getting worse and worse. After our show at Sacramento State last week, we realized he wasn't going to get off drugs while being in DGD. We didn't want to completely cut him off, though, so we decided to go on hiatus until he could clean himself up. Obviously, this is a disappointing hurdle, as no band ever wants to have to cancel a tour for any reason, let alone over something like this. How does the band plan to move forward? Do you expect to come back from this hiatus? I hope the best for Johnny. Hardcore drug addiction is no joke or reason for ridicule. If Johnny can put this problem behind him, we'd be glad to come back stronger than ever. Until that happens, DGD will stay on hiatus. If there is a future for Dance Gavin Dance, how does Johnny Craig fit into it? We're not replacing him. He's always got a place in DGD. Oh, really, bro? Is there anything you'd like to expand upon or say to Dance Gavin Dance fans? Thank you for the years of support and love. We want to come back and make more music for you, but first and foremost, want Johnny to improve himself and become the man we know he can be. We're not quitting music altogether, though. The other members of DGD and I are working on a full length for our side project band called Secret Band, and we'll record a full length very soon. We'll announce more on this in the coming weeks. That's all for now, folks. Stay tuned for part three, coming Sunday, September 13th of 2020. Thank you all so much for watching.